A very good morning to you all for joining us for this event. Those of you following the Digital Services Act will not have failed to notice that a lot of the conversation has been around disinformation, but today we are hoping to move that conversation further on from the usual old talking points and discuss how to really hold platforms to account. This event is organized by BEIC, the consumer organization. Um, we have a great lineup of speakers for you, but the way it's going to work is that we are going to have a keynote presentation first, and then we will go into our panel debate. So everyone knows this event is being recorded. Now, there is an option for you under the website that you can see underneath the video streaming. You will see an option there where you can leave a comment. Now, because we do want the event to be interactive and allow everyone to get their questions in, you can write a Q&A in there if you wish. Please do keep your questions concise. If there is a point or a panelist that you specifically want to answer the questions, please note that as well. Otherwise, you can just put to all panelists and we will do our best in the next hour and a quarter or so to get to as many of those questions as we can. Now with that, it is my pleasure to introduce, to give the keynote presentation from which uh, it is Nina Bati, who is head of campaigns. Nina, you're gonna give us a presentation on what you have discovered. So I'm gonna hand the floor over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so hello, I am Nina Bati, head of campaigns at WITCH, the UK Consumers Association. Over the last four years, we have been looking into the issues affecting consumers in the digital age with the increased use of online marketplaces to buy products and to research and consume, consume information online. This has become even more important in 2020 as internet use to shop, work and socialize online has dramatically increased due to the current pandemic and lockdown restrictions. I'm going to dive right in today as I've been given seven minutes to walk you through our findings, investigating the sale of unsafe products, the rise in misleading and um, fake online reviews, and how fake ads and misleading information can reach targeted audiences. In order to understand these harms online and the impact they have on consumers, we have conducted a series of product testing, investigations across a number of online platforms and consumer research in these areas. On to the next slide, please. So our areas of concern, as I've already noted, our overall findings in this space, um, from across a range of online marketplaces, including Amazon, Google, Facebook, eBay, Wish.com and AliExpress, have found common issues. One, marketplaces often fail to bring in preventative measures to identify harms and effectively address harms on their sites made known to them. While often quick to respond when informed, platforms' reactive measures are inconsistent and ineffective and often do not lead to overall reduction in harm on their sites. There is little transparency about the responsibilities of marketplaces and therefore consumers often believe that platforms have responsibility to keep them safe and have under undertaken preliminary checks on the content on their sites. Online platforms often fall between the gaps of many regulatory frameworks, which has led to the emergence of these online harms, but with little regulatory oversight and enforcement to effectively deal with them. Next slide, please. So unsafe products and online marketplaces. Online marketplaces such as Amazon and eBay are becoming increasingly popular to buy products, with nine in 10 UK consumers having shopped on these sites in the last year. However, working with European testing partners, we have found high rates of safety failures, with two thirds of the 250 products across 18 product categories purchased from the site. These include children's toys with levels of toxic chemicals that breach EU limits by up to seven times, smoke and carbon monoxide alarms that have failed to detect smoke and CO during standard testing and therefore would be ineffective in the event of an emergency, and USB charges that have posed a fire or electrocution risk. While listings were taken down, within days we found listings reappearing. This occurred three times with unbranded dangerous smoke alarms and child car seats already flagged to the marketplaces. We've also found banned products on sale. For example, a number of toys listed on the EU safety gate database and car seats sold by unapproved sellers and therefore illegal to be sold in the UK. We believe in one case we found potentially 100 unsafe toys on marketplaces, but due to incomplete information such as batch numbers and product codes, we were not able to confidently publish on this. This patchy information proves how hard it can be for any consumer or market authority to identify potentially dangerous products online. 
There are often mixed responses from across platforms, but with little action taken to prevent unsafe products from coming online in the first place. And despite signing the EU voluntary pledge, we have found action to be inadequate. Our research shows that only one in five of UK online marketplace users are aware that online marketplaces have no legal responsibility for the safety of items available on their sites. 70% of users, though, thought the law should change to make this a legal responsibility, and 90% thought that the marketplace should be either solely or jointly involved in product recalls. Next slide, please. So on to fake reviews. Um, online reviews are becoming ever important to consumers' buying decisions. Um, our research shows that 97% of consumers consult reviews when purchasing products online, and over three in four trust that online customer reviews are genuine. In 2015, reviews contributed to over £23 billion worth of consumer spending in the UK. Now we estimate that to be closer to £38 billion. However, online reviews can make or break a business, and our investigations have found many resorting to tactics such as bribery, hacking, and gaming platform systems to mislead shoppers. Fake review factories can also be found promoted on Google or through Facebook groups. However, we have also found that online platforms' own systems and activities can exacerbate the problem. Review hijacking is made possible through platforms allowing merging reviews across product variations without proper checks. And online sites own use of reviews to inform search rankings and endorsement algorithms incentivize sellers to game the system. For example, 45% of shoppers said they were more likely to purchase a product from Amazon if it had the choice badge than without. Sellers are aware of this, and therefore we have found numerous examples of products with a choice logo with an overall star rating that we believe have been inflated with suspicious looking reviews. We also put these glowing reviews to the test in our labs and found the products did not live up to the hype. In one case, we found a vacuum cleaner with a 4.9 star overall rating that could not even lift dust from the carpet. Worryingly, we know fake reviews have an impact on consumers buying decisions. Our behavioural tests have proven that shoppers are twice as likely to buy a poorer quality product and potentially unsafe product if there are fake reviews present. Next slide, please. So a last test I wanted to share with you was our investigation into fake ads. We found that it took only hours for fraudsters to post fake ads on Google and Facebook, which had a lack of effective controls. We created two linked fake companies, a water brand named Remedy, and Natural Hydration, an online service offering pseudo health and hydration advice to expose how easy it could be for fraudsters to create and promote false adverts. Google just required advertisers to have a Gmail account to create adverts, and while it did review adverts submitted, it did not verify if the business existed or was legitimate, nor ask for proof of ID. Within an hour, the ad was up, and in a month, it had over 100,000 impressions. On Facebook, we created and paid for the promotion of a business page for natural hydration and produced a range of posts with pseudo health advice. In a week, it garnered 500 likes. Concerningly, through this, we were able to reach targeted audiences. On Facebook, we targeted females aged 18 to 65 with interests in health and well being, water, and extreme weight loss. On Google, it was possible, possible to target users who searched for terms such as eczema treatment, high blood pressure, and suicide. We believe with the growing role that online platforms play in the daily lives of consumers, and in order for consumers to continue to enjoy the many benefits, new responsibilities and regulatory frameworks are needed to ensure healthy digital markets for the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Nina. And um, we may indeed have follow-up questions. Um, our audience hasn't put any yet, but uh, stay with us. Even though we move on to the panel debate, there may indeed be some specific questions for you based on that research. Thank you very much for that. Of course, our panelists may indeed want to ask you something about your research as well. And with that, I am going to move on now to the panel discussion part of today's event. And joining me, we are very welcoming uh, of Alex Adjus Saliba, MEP at the European Parliament in the SD Group. We also have Christoph Busch, Professor of Law at the University of Osnabrück. We have Ricardo Castaniera from the Permanent Representation of Portugal, of course, next to take over the EU presidency in January. 
Catherine Van Riet, Director General at Toys Industries of Europe. And last but not least, Ursula Patchell, Deputy Director General at Bayok. Ladies and gentlemen, you're all very, very welcome. Um, let me start with a broad opening question to all of you uh, and give you a few minutes just to give your reaction to this theme that we're talking about today. So I want to ask is, well, we've heard from, from Nina, but um, are currently online marketplaces sufficiently taking care of their customers? Um, are they being held to account? What are the areas of concern and how do we deal with it? So the overall question of today's debate, I'd like you each to reflect on it. Alex, let me start with you. So, first of all, I would like to thank Bayouk for this very timely event in a very important week when it comes to um, Parliament's work, when it comes to online marketplaces and digital players, and also a higher level of consumer protection, something which is our biggest target in the report that was approved by uh, the plenary, a report which of which I was a rapporteur and Beuk, and I would like to, 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 to say this also publicly today, was one of our biggest allies even during the um, political and technical discussion and even before the drafting stage. So um, the issue of consumer protection was always of fundamental importance in the recommendations to basically make the e-commerce directive, a 20-year-old directive, more relevant for the problems that have been highlighted by the presentation that we have witnessed a few minutes ago, which are real problems, which are problems that our consumers throughout Europe are facing on a daily basis. The positive aspect from a technical point of view, from a political point of view in Parliament, that first of all, um, our report is dedicating a whole chapter for online marketplaces. Uh, and this compromise, first of all, was approved with um, big majorities within the IMCO, um, IMCO uh, group uh, in, in the European Parliament, but the whole report which was approved last Tuesday in a vote which took place uh, in the plenary of the Parliament, so now it's the official position, official recommendation of the European Parliament to the, um, to the European Commission for the revision of the um, e-commerce and the DSA package, um, we have basically unanimous support from all the MEPs of all the mainstream parties, basically Greens, EPP, SND, and Renew. So um, I think that the position is clear, and the position of the European Parliament is a plea to the Commission that we want and we should have in the DSA strong consumer protection and also direct regulation on online marketplaces and the work my work as a reporter although it has officially um, reached its climax with the with the approval of the report last tuesday but it is not yet finished because we will continue to mount pressure on the commission so that the parliament's recommendations especially and i'm going to reiterate this point and make it clear also after seeing the leaks of the Commission on the on the future DSA, we will continue to mount pressure on the Commission to tackle these issues so that consumer, a high level of consumer protection is top priority, not fifth, sixth, eighth priority of the DSA proposal, but it is top priority for the DSA proposal. And why is it important? Why is it important to have a high level of consumer protection um, and address the issues of counterfeit products of unsafe products of this level playing field, which is totally inexistent in the real world. So what are we facing today? We are facing a situation where consumers who are made, making their purchases offline have a high level of consumer protection, but those consumers who are making their purchases uh, online are receiving third or fourth level of protection. And this is not on. This is not on when we are seeing um, our consumers' behavior is shifting and going more for online purchases. Um, and basically, we are regulating this sector by a 20-year-old legislation, which is not up to date, which is not um, as advanced enough um, as the technical and technological advancements that have that have happened during the past 20 years. So it's really important for us that the Commission takes up 
uh, our recommendations, our recommendations, first of all, for giving an extraterritorial element to the DSA, which is of fundamental importance when it comes to consumer protection. And what we are saying with that, it's uh, a shame to, 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 to put it mildly, let's put it like that, to have a high level of consumer protection and high level uh, of requirements for, Euro for European producers, for European distributors who want to move their products within the internal market. And then we have a big legal loophole of third country sellers targeting our markets, targeting our users, targeting directly our consumers through online marketplaces. And basically, they are not, uh, are not um, adopting our technical harmonization, especially when it comes to health and safety regulation. So the numbers are there. The numbers of uh, fake products, counterfeit products, products such as cosmetics, um, which are and, and medicinal products, which are basically um, being uh, entering in, the, in, in our market and not abiding by our rules is something which is very worrying for us. So giving that extraterritorial effect to the DSA would basically um, be very beneficial. The know your business customer provision, again, one of the points raised, raised by which is that incorrect information uh, is being given on, for example, the sellers who are um, marketing their products in our, in our market. So we believe that the know your business customer would be very beneficial um, to this too. And also the last point, so that um, I can give also opportunity to other, other speakers, also the issue of um, imposing further obligations on online marketplaces when um, they are basically letting third country sellers using their platforms. We are making it clear, and this is one of the most, I think, revolutionary um, provisions in our report, that they have to have a representative within the union. So if something goes wrong, someone has to be held accountable. And if there is no representative in the union, then the online marketplace have to answer to our consumers. It's, it's, it's a shame that we are treating consumers as direct importers without having any um, cushion of protection in the union when they are buying from third country sellers. And this is something which we are addressing in our report. And it's something we're going to address in our debate. We will certainly come back to that point. Christoph, let me turn to you uh, and ask the same broad question. Are marketplaces currently accountable? If not, why not? And what are the areas of concern for you? Well, I, uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to discuss uh, this uh, very important uh, topic. Um, I, I think it's uh, helpful uh, to, to remember that um, online marketplaces have fundamentally changed uh, the structure of uh, online uh, retail. And actually, the term marketplace may be even a little bit misleading. Why? Well, because uh, the term marketplace suggests that companies like Amazon create a virtual space uh, in which uh, supply meets uh, demand and different uh, providers compete freely for customers. But that's not exactly how it works. Uh, digital platforms are not really a free forum. Uh, major uh, platforms are um, maybe better described as centrally controlled and monitored uh, digital environments where matching algorithms and algorithmic rankings determine which product is displayed in a customer's buy box and which product ends up in uh, the virtual shopping cart. Uh, in many cases, uh, platforms also offer payment services, fulfillment services. From a consumer perspective, this is very convenient, but it also means that the platform is much more than just a facilitator or an intermediary. Um, from a legal perspective, and I'm a lawyer, so from a legal perspective, you might still say that the marketplace is not the seller in a formal sense, but in substance, it's actually the key player in the transaction, the one uh, who has decisive influence over uh, the transaction. And in such a case, I think substance 
should prevail over form. Uh, therefore, um, a, a platform operator who has decisive influence uh, should be held to account. Uh, as the saying goes, with great power comes great responsibility. And uh, the current legal framework doesn't live up uh, to uh, this uh, principle. The e-commerce uh, directive, which uh, 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 imposes liability uh, to platform operators only if they have actual knowledge of illegal uh, activity or information, uh, does not uh, impose an active, a positive duty of care for online marketplaces to proactively uh, uh, ensure that there are no uh, dangerous uh, products uh, and offers. Platforms basically can wait until something happens. And that is, of course, too little and too late uh, for uh, a, a consumer who has suffered uh, a damage. So there is a, a gap. The current uh, legal framework does not uh, reflect the changes in the marketplace that we have seen over the past years. Thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, Ricardo, let me turn to you now as well and get your opening thoughts on the topic. Well, good morning, Jennifer. Good morning to everyone. And thank you very much for having me. Uh, as the upcoming presidency, uh, we've been hearing a lot of stakeholders and receiving dozens of comments. And let me start them saying that we, we all recognize the need to improve and update the current rules applied to online uh, commerce relations. And uh, we agree that a modern framework will enhance responsibilities for intermediary platforms and also clear rules on transparency and information obligations are absolutely needed. That is clear to everyone, including the industry. And it's an important uh, remark. Actually, it's very interesting to note that high number of responses from member states stakeholders and even non-EU countries, for example, Japan, Australia, United States, to the public consultation um, uh, launched by the Commission. It shows the global relevance of this subject and that the need for this reform as um, a common um, denominator. It's also clear to everyone that we should do this in a balanced manner, upholding consumers' rights online, while avoiding creating also complex uh, rules that would prevent the emergence of new market entrants and ultimately impact the, on consumers' choice and welfare. But there are many areas of concern that during the last weeks we've heard from several stakeholders, as I've already said. For instance, there is a growing concern about business models based on selling consumers' data to advertisers. We must look at these and understand impacts on consumers and citizens. The number of counterfeit of or dangerous products online, medicines, for instance, it is increasing and current measures is in place that don't seem to be working effectively, as it has been shown uh, during the first uh, uh, quite impressive uh, presentation the, the, this morning. Consumers feel disempowered, lacking control and manipulated by recommender systems and targeted ads, as of already um, we saw the, on that presentation and operators lack legal clarity to engage in proactive measures. Last but not the least, one thing that we've, also, that we've already identified is that enforcement should also be strengthened. I think those are the main issues that I would like to underline on my first uh, uh, comment. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you, Ricardo. Catherine, uh, let us turn to you um, from Toys Industries of Europe. How do you see the current situation and what are your main concerns? Um, yes, hello, good morning. Thank you very much for having me. So I represent what, I, what the reputable um, toy manufacturers. Unfortunately, Nina's presentation um, and her findings were no surprise to us because at TIE we did our own assessment um, and we discovered for, for the survey, you know, the assessment that we did, no less than 97 percent of the toys that we bought um, were illegal and should never have been allowed to be sold um, in Europe. And 76% of the toys that we tested proved to be a real danger to children. So this is something that we're really worried about. And I have to say, I completely agree um, with the previous speakers. At the moment, there just isn't enough accountability um, for the, the online marketplaces. 
At the same time, I have to say for our sector, of course, you know, these online marketplaces are also really important sales channels. So for us, it's super important that they remain trusted by the consumers. Um, you know, so we, we, we it just, the situation just needs to be improved. And we can, we think it can be improved if the DSA recognizes the principle that what is illegal offline should also be illegal online. There are very strict rules. There are specific toy safety rules in the EU, but they're meaningless if they can't be properly enforced. We know enforcement is really difficult when we're dealing with toys bought through online marketplaces because of the quantity, because they are parcels that are delivered straight to the consumer. And if an unsafe toy is caught, then the seller can't be found, or you know, usually it's very difficult or impossible to find. So the market surveillance action has no real result. So we feel that when there is no economic operator in the EU who can be held accountable, then the online marketplace needs to be legally recognized as either the importer or the distributor with the same kind of obligations. They are not, as um, um, Christopher was explaining, they're not passive hosting service providers. They do much more. They really enable the sell. And I completely agree. We were happy um, with the European Parliament's recommendations. Prevention is key. And that's why we need to know your business customer. And in addition to that, we also feel that online platforms should verify whether there is a responsible person established in the EU, especially um, an importer. And if no importer is named, as I said, then they should have the responsibility and the obligations of the importer. Of course, reaction is also important. And they are exceptionally placed to know who has bought their toys. You know, So they need to be able to go back to those consumers. And we found that wasn't really done in our survey. Not all of them went back to the consumers to say, you have bought an unsafe toy, don't let your child play with it. That's something that we were really disappointed in. That's just a few thoughts. <laughs> Thank you for that, Catherine. Um, Ursula, let me finally ask you for your opening comments um, and your thoughts in the area in general. Yes, good morning and thank you very much, Jennifer. Uh, there have been so many great points already made. I think I can be rather uh, brief. Indeed, from a consumer perspective, we really thought it was time to move the discussion, not only to, to talk about content removals, freedom of expression, which traditionally was a bit the focus of the discussion on the DSA, but really to go and look at the situation of how consumers are exposed to dangerous products, to fake advertising, to fake reviews, to scams, to price coaching, etc., all happening on the platforms. And I think Nina has given us a very clear and alarming oversight of what is going on. And let me just underline, this is not only uh, the case for UK consumers, but it is really the situation that consumers face uh, across uh, the European uh, Union. So the, the, the situation is actually untenable from a consumer protection point of view. And we are very glad that the European Parliament and Alex explained it very well today, has really stood up to call on the European Commission to put forward a proposal for the DSA that really will tackle the situation. So let me maybe just uh, list the four main points that should be done in the DSA from our point of view. So first of all, as has been already said also by Christoph uh, and other interveners this morning, we need to fix that problem that now the platforms are really left off the hook in terms of responsibility and liability when consumers are exposed to these illegal activities. So um, they make big profits out of their business, but they are not hold accountable. So we need a clarification and an adaptation of the current liability regime for online marketplaces. Point number one. Point number two, we need to make sure that platforms look at the legitimacy of the traders that they host on their platforms. So we want to have a principle established that is known as the know your business user principle. So Nina explained that very well. It's super easy to get on a platform. There is no check. You just need an email address and then you just can go and put everything out there. And that's not what we want. We have also seen a very uh, impressive report from the Wall Street Journal that shows how platforms go, for example, to China and recruit traders and they have no idea and they don't care what are actually these traders doing then to European consumers. So this should not happen. Thirdly, 
we want that platforms also conduct random checks on what is going on on their platforms, just like consumer organizations do. So uh, they, 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 they should not just easily get away and just have listings uh, and have reappearance of products uh, that have already been um, um, identified as being illegal. That happens all the time now, as Nina also demonstrated. And the fourth point, which also has been mentioned, enforcement is absolutely key. Uh, a law is only as strong as the enforcement system that it comes with. And that's a point that also uh, Vice President Vestager has just underlined this week in the European Parliament. And it's the weakness also of the current e-commerce directive. So that must be really a, a, a real improvement in the new proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ursa. I can see we're getting quite a lot of questions in uh, for, from the audience. So I'm gonna jump in straight away with some of those. Um, Catherine, I'm going to put this to you since it was it's somewhat related to what you were already saying, which was what are platforms obligations when it comes to recalls of damaged or dangerous products? Um, at the moment, there is, um, uh, I think there's very little um, responsibility um, because they're, they're not seen as the seller. Um, and that's, that's one of the main, um, main problems. I, I mean, I, you know, as a, I think all of us buy online and if you have a damaged product you know that you can return it um, but uh, uh, we're talking here about dangerous products and not everybody is going to actually know that they've bought a dangerous product they will only you know discover this when when something has really gone wrong and that's you know that that's really super tricky and then they, there is no accountability on the platform itself uh, Ursula perhaps you could uh, answer that as well I mean what about recalls Yes, I think that, uh, that's a very uh, good question. So the, the system of the e-commerce uh, uh, directive, but I think Christoph can probably explain that much better uh, than I can, is actually not looking at what are really the obligation in such circumstances, but it's going the other way around. So it sets the principles that platforms are actually exempted from liability, right? And only in very narrow and very, I would say, unclear uh, situations the platforms could be responsible for becoming active to avoid illegal activities. We've seen that, for example, in the in the COVID lockdown weeks now, where there was an enormous amount of scams of of, of fraudulent advertising. And we have seen the CPC network, the consumer authority networks, they gave notice to the platforms that they should look out, but they couldn't oblige them to really take action. And I think this demonstrates very well the weakness of the current legal framework. Okay, thank you very much for that, Ursula. Um, Jamin Patel has said that the witch study shows products are reappearing very quickly after their first removal. Um, I'm wondering, asking, how can this be addressed? Alex, can this sort of thing be addressed within the DSA? Yes, definitely. First of all, on, on, on the question also of information, when online marketplaces have information that something is wrong with products which are online, and what, what the parliament is basically um, proposing. So the DSA, first of all, so should ensure that consumers are informed um, uh, once a product that they have purchased has been um, removed from the marketplace, and that online marketplaces should consult RAPEX and also notify competent, competent authorities as soon as they become aware of illegal and unsafe, unsafe counterfeit products on their platforms. Online marketplaces should also remove quickly um, any known misleading information which is given by the supplier, including misleading implicit, implicit guarantees, for example, which are given, or statements, misleading statements, which are the order of the day and, and as has already been stated, this was visible um, throughout the past years, but it has become more visible, more uh, prevalent during the COVID-19 pandemic when we saw a huge amount of scams, for example, with products claiming to be um, protecting uh, users, our consumers from getting COVID, products which could treat COVID. These were the order of the day during the past um, weeks and months. Also, once products have been identified as unsafe or counterfeited by the union's rapid alert systems, by national market surveillance authorities, by customs authorities, 
or also by consumer protection authorities, it should be compulsory and not optional um, to remove products for, from marketplaces expediously and also within a maximum, and this is clearly highlighted in our report, within a maximum of two working days of receiving notification. And if this is not done, um, online marketplace places should become responsible. Um, so so that's, that's, that's our point, that if these strict procedures are not put in place, and this is something which, which, which um, is really important when you have a product which is online, it's moving fast in different markets in different countries. If no expedious action is taken to remove these dangerous products, which can affect the health, affect the safety, of our consumers, then the whole system um, would fail. So it's really important to have these strict um, requirements which are put in place. Uh, Christoph, I want the same question to you and perhaps we'll even get Nina back in again. How do we stop these products, these dangerous products or faulty products reappearing um, time after time so that it's not just a constant game of whack-a-mole? Well, I think the first step is uh, to, uh, to uh, clarify and to lay down uh, binding uh, um, uh, due diligence requirements uh, of platforms. So far, we have only uh, rather soft um, uh, uh, rules here. Uh, I'm uh, talking about the product safety pledge uh, that, that was uh, made by a group of uh, important uh, platforms in 2018. But that's just a voluntary pledge uh, where, where the uh, platforms um, have uh, promised uh, to act expeditiously to react within two days uh, to a notification of dangerous products by member states and to react within five days if uh, uh, consumers uh, notify dangerous products. But this is not a binding law. This is just a voluntary pledge. So uh, th there are no uh, serious sanctions uh, behind uh, this. It's a paper tiger, you, you might say. Yeah? Uh, uh, and uh, I think the first step would be uh, to, to have something solid uh, on this. And then as um, the other uh, speakers uh, have emphasized, enforcement uh, is, uh, is key. Nina, thank you for staying with us. Um, since this question was very much related to, to your study, um, how do you prevent these products reappearing over and over and over again? Um, I think we've learned from um, how these online marketplaces have actually um, become so important in consumers' lives that they are very good at responding to consumer need. I think what they need to do is um, what we need to figure out is what are the right incentives and the right um, frameworks that would help to draw that um, real expertise and understanding about AI and their own systems to really start to put it towards preventative measures. At the moment, because those responsibilities aren't there, the efforts haven't been put towards that as such. And it's been much more about the reactive because they have been I guess falling through the regulatory um, frameworks of existing ones up to this point. Um, some of the points that we've talked about is looking at those definitions that are currently in um, regulatory frameworks for economic operators and where online marketplaces um, fit within that, um, but also recognizing the unique role that the marketplace um, operators have as well in terms of that complete oversight over who is operating on their sites, who is transacting with who, where, where products are going, and actually using that over oversight to be able to marshal um, the right activities in the right spaces, particularly if they are informed, but also doing a lot more of the preventative checks to reduce um, the uh, likelihood um, of these products, dangerous products coming onto the sites in the first place. Thank you. You've gone somewhere to answering one of the other questions as well as what sort of responsibility should marketplaces have before uh, selling to consumers. Um, we have another question in uh, that says there are many different types of marketplaces. Should all have the same obligations or should there be differentiation? I'm going to tie that to a, a second question I see, which is emphasizing the difference between first party and third party marketplaces. So Ursula, there are different types. Um, what should be the obligations and the differentiations between them? Is there one size fits all? 
Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that's a very relevant question indeed. And that's one of the weaknesses of the e-commerce directive as we know it currently, that there are no such differentiations. And it's only about the, the differences between what the platforms do in terms of hosting or just facilitating their conduit, et cetera, et cetera. So our position is that we need to have this specific regime for online marketplaces, because as was just very well described also by by Nina, they have a very specific position with regards to the commercial users they have on their platform and with regards to the consumer users. Uh, and they facilitate the, the, the selling of services and products, which many other um, um, uh, platforms uh, don't do at all. So social media platforms, uh, other platforms have different um, roles and do different things. So we have to make a differentiation between what type of illegal activities happen on what type of platforms. And there we need to really nuance uh, the new uh, DSA in terms of taking specific account. And just to make it very clear, we would like to have a specific liability regime for online marketplaces. Also to achieve what Alex um, very well illustrated, that we need to have the same level of protection and I would like to underline the at least the same level of protection um, for consumers if they shop on their high street shop or if they shop online and currently that is not at all the case so that's important to make this differentiation. Christoph, uh, let me come to you the same question. Yes, indeed. Um, the great variety of business models uh, in the platform economy is indeed one of the major challenges uh, when it comes to regulatory design, because uh, you cannot have a one size fits all uh, solution uh, here. I think that's that's clear. But uh, when when it gets to the details, it becomes really tricky. Um, uh, one uh, uh, possible uh, distinction would be uh, be uh, between big platforms and small uh, platforms. That is sometimes uh, being discussed, but I'm hesitant uh, about uh, uh, this um, because we don't have such a distinction between big shops and small shops in the offline world when it comes to consumer rules. So I wouldn't say that small platforms, startups, should be subject uh, uh, to, to a softer uh, consumer protection uh, um, uh, scheme. Uh, consumers should, should be able to expect to buy safe products, whether it's from a big platform or a small platform. That, that I think should be clear. Um, what, what might be um, uh, a criterion for uh, differentiating uh, uh, the, the regulatory system is the, the degree of involvement of the platform in the uh, transactions. Um, sometimes this is put under the heading of predominant influence or decisive influence over the transactions. There are platforms that only display product listings. There are others that uh, are involved in payment uh, systems, even in shipping uh, fulfillment uh, systems, uh, uh, services. And the more the platform is involved in the transaction, the higher the responsibility and the more likely liability uh, should strike. Now, then again, if, if that means um, if a platform does fulfillment services, and that means liability, and if a platform does not do fulfillment services, and that does not mean liability, what, what will be the reaction on the marketplace? Does that mean that smaller platforms will switch from fulfillment services to direct shipping? Would that mean that bigger platforms who can still afford to offer um, uh, fulfillment services, even if that entails liability, uh, will be more attractive to consumers. So will that mean that consumers will shift to these bigger platforms? What does that mean from a competition uh, perspective? So you see, it's really tricky to get the regulatory design right. Thank you very much. Alex, perhaps uh, you would like to just weigh in yes. that. I know you have opinions on it. Yes, so I think that this question was totally also reflected in, in our report. First of all, there is no one size fits all for all um, digital players out there. And this dis distinction has been made throughout all our reports. Some um, principles such as transparency, such as the know your business customer principle. And again, I want to reiterate this point because this is also reflected in the leaked commission's proposal. 
we don't want, and the parliament is not asking the commission to restrict the Know Your Business customer provision only for online marketplaces, but we want the Know Your Business customer provision for all um, digital services out there, intermediating in the online ecosystem. But we have, apart from these general obligations, which we believe are reflective also of our values, are reflective also of European values, such as, as I said, transparency, know your business customer, the Exante system. Then we have differentiated a bit. And I think that this was also a clear message from Parliament. When we have dedicated in our report, report a whole chapter with specific responsibilities for online marketplaces. Why? Because the business model in which the online marketplaces are operating um, poses some different challenges from other, um, other, other, other sectors. And I, I'm, I'm also, um, uh, I also agree that um, it's, it's really important not to differentiate also when it comes to the level of protection. All consumers must have the same level of protection. It doesn't matter if a consumer makes its purchase from a small marketplace or from a larger marketplace. As I said in the beginning of my presentation, there should never be second class consumers, first class consumers and third class consumers. So the obligations and the responsibilities for online marketplaces should be the same. And all our consumers should have the same level of protection both in, on the online ecosystem and also when compared to the offline ecosystem. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move the conversation on a little bit. We're going to talk in the next sort of half hour a bit more about enforcement, but also about services as well as products. Um, but Ricardo, so let's ask about the, the issue of direct imports from a seller base outside the EU selling to an EU consumer. Market surveillance authorities are often underfunded and they may be the best place to enforce it. How do we address that issue and how can the DSA address that issue? Well, Jennifer, just because give me just one second to reply to your previous or go back to your previous question because i think that uh, and, uh, at least it's our perception that one size fits all does not work here um, we really believe that uh, probably we should have a common uh, set of obligations uh, with transparency and some other kind of, uh, of duties applicable to all players but of course, we believe also that there are uh, a specific set of rules that should only be applicable to some some extent to to the largest players. Um, uh, it's 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 very important to understand that there are very different kinds of platforms. Um, nevertheless, the way that they impact consumers can be the same. But the fact is that the platforms they are not uh, equal. They have different dimensions. They have different technical aspects, and it must be taken in, into account. But regarding your 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 question. First, we think that uh, uh, extending the scope to any operator uh, targeting the EU market, uh, regardless of its place of establishment, will for sure <clears throat> enhance the outreach of the European consumers' protection and adapt the rules to the digital uh, reality. This is something that, uh, of course, it must be addressed by, 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 by the DSA. Um, and uh, we think that it would, uh, I would say, um, respond to your uh, to your question. Last but not the least, um, and this is an open question that we've identified from several stakeholders, and there are different opinions, even uh, I would say, uh, probably inside the council. Um, it's about enforcement, and because your question is also linked with enforcement, the question is: Should we um, create a EU centralized authority? Is it needed, or just reinforce the cooperation between member states? Those questions or these uh, two questions in one are, are, are very important. We don't have yet the, the answer, as you can imagine, but per perhaps it's, uh, this discussion can also uh, make some light uh, on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, I want to put this same sort of enforcement question. We got a question in from Andrea, who's watching. Who should control the new content, uh, the new liability regime, if, if it does come in with the DSA? Sorry. Um, I, I, honestly, uh, I think I, 
it should, you know, if, if, if there are proper enforcement tools, then it should be controlled, you know, I guess, um, on the, in, in, the, in the member states where the uh, main office of the, of the online marketplace is. Um, yeah, so I, yeah. I, I don't know. Um, and, and, and in terms of a centralized authority, at least if, if that's what I've understood um, from the European Commission, of centralized authority for market surveillance also on in the offline world a lot can still be improved in terms of market surveillance <laughs> so the more cooperation between the member states the better really um, so in that's something that we would definitely um, you know very very much welcome because you know it's not just um, online that there are problems but offline um, you know we also still there's lots of products on RAPEX that are not sold um, online. Um, so, you know, I just wanted to make that point as well. Ursula, let me turn to you uh, again, this question of enforcement. Andrea is asking who should control the new liability regime. We've heard Ricardo mention enforcement as one of his first things in, in these opening comments. Um, you've had a chance to hear a lot of different points. Give me, give me your reflections on all of those if you can. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, a key question. Let me just, and that is linked to enforcement, also respond to this, um, the, 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 the statement, one size fits all, whether that's a good approach or not. And there, I think we also need to have on our horizon that there is not only the DSA, but there is also a proposal on the ex ante uh, rules that the Commission will present. And that is really trying to tackle the gatekeepers, and that is trying to tackle the big platforms. So I think there is this differentiation also how the DSA and the whole package will be rolled out. And from a consumer perspective, uh, for the e-commerce directive reform, it does not matter whether it's a big trader or a small trader, the protection should be the same. I think that's just a very fundamental principle. So far, the European Union has stuck to that principle across the board in food safety, in product safety, in uh, all other elements. So I think that must be the overarching principle here. Coming to the enforcement question, for <clears throat> everything which is more related to competition market regulation, we would favor a centralized approach. So for example, for the exante market rules, we say it should be the commission who is in charge, but maybe it's a difficult question, of course, for the reform of the e-commerce directive, we think that if, if we have a good system where there is a very strong network of authorities at the national level that work together, that could be a model, we would of course have to um, uh, take into account that there are so many different elements uh, that would be covered. The scope of this DSA is very big, so we would have market authorities, market surveillance authorities, consumer authorities, maybe other authorities. So maybe a reference authority like we have it in the CPC and the consumer um, a cooperation regulation could be a model and it must be a strong network. One thing I would like to underline, um, if we listen to the Commission and in particular DG Connect, there is always reference to the country of origin principle as something that is really the basis for the single market. When it comes to enforcement, we don't think it's the right principle. Look at the GDPR, look at how it has turned out what was supposed to be a very innovative uh, approach to enforcement really effectively giving one solution to EU wide infringement. Everything landed in Ireland because the platform sit there. You could very well imagine how this will then turn out if we have the same principles now in the DSA. So we don't, we don't think that's the right approach. We think maybe it could be the authority um, that takes the lead that is most affected, or uh, it's just a coordination decision by the network who takes the lead. So there could be other models, uh, but it should not be what we have already seen does not work. We should learn from the mistakes that the GDPR unfortunately has in it. Thank you. Thank you, Ursula. Um, I want to ask uh, Nadja to Christoph and Alex, um, what about the, the services element? Um, and, and you know, where are the shortcomings in the current e-commerce directive with regard to services and the supply of services? Christoph. Well, as far as I see, um, uh, the uh, current e-commerce directive, which is a horizontal uh, legal uh, framework, uh, covers goods and services uh, uh, alike. Uh, so uh, as, as far as uh, um, 
the services provided by online marketplaces are concerned, their uh, online marketplaces are uh, themselves service uh, providers. If, if we talk about uh, fulfillment uh, services or other uh, elements, um, so this is probably not um, uh, uh, an, an issue that relates to intermediary liability, but rather to first party liability for services that they uh, uh, provide. Uh, uh, here, I think um, the um, uh, a recent um, EU uh, a directive on digital content and digital services might, uh, 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 which, which is in the process of uh, implementation, might add an interesting element. Uh, because if you, if you say that um, the matching service that is provided by an online marketplace is a digital service under the digital services uh, directive, well, the rules on the quality of such digital services, uh, Article 8 of the uh, Digital Content Directive, uh, apply here. Um, so uh, it will be interesting to see uh, whether um, the courts will use this vector uh, uh, to uh, hold uh, platforms responsible for the services, for the matching services, uh, the um, uh, 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 let's say sorting uh, services, product display services uh, will will be held responsible uh, here. But if I may add one point to enforcement, uh, is is that possible? Oh, thanks. Um, uh, the one problem uh, that, that we haven't addressed yet here is that we have a diversity of enforcement systems across member states. I'm from Germany, and in Germany, uh, enforcement of consumer law is uh, a basically a completely private uh, enforcement. We don't have a, a, a central uh, a consumer enforcement uh, authority. Um, the Bundeskartellamt, the federal cartel office, has been uh, pushing towards more uh, public uh, enforcement, but so far not very successful. And I think in the near future, this will become a problem because the business models that we are talking uh, about here are more and more algorithmic. Uh, business models, black box uh, business models, whether we talk about rankings, matching, uh, uh, automated uh, uh, monitoring of reviews in order to detect fake reviews, whether it's automated vetting uh, of uh, suppliers, all this is automated and algorithm uh, uh, driven. That means we are talking about black box systems and it's impossible for individual consumers to identify what is happening there. And it's also very, very difficult uh, for uh, consumer associations to open these black uh, boxes. Whereas uh, public uh, uh, enforcement authorities have the investigative powers to open these black boxes. In countries where you have mainly private enforcement, like Germany, there will be a growing gap between uh, the, the duties laid down in the law and the ability of uh, those who are responsible for enforcement. So I think we would see a shift to more public enforcement here in those member states that haven't gone uh, yet uh, in this direction. Alex, your thoughts? So, yes, on services. So I think starting with the enforcement, enforcement also um, question. A year and a half ago, when I was elected in the European Parliament and I chose the Internal Market and Consumer um, Committee as my primary committee, I made a, a meeting with, with uh, the MCCAA, which basically is the Consumer and Competition Authority uh, in Malta. And my first blunt question was, what is your um, biggest challenge? Something which uh, is your biggest worry. And they told me our biggest worry is um, enforcement, supervision uh, of what's going on and what products are entering uh, in Malta through these online marketplaces. So enforcement, cooperation and supervision are three important words which were totally, totally missing from the e-commerce framework that is still um, enforceable today. And it is of utmost importance. And I think that when you look at the three reports which were approved by Parliament, I think that um, we have uh, some differences there uh, on, on, on the level of, of, of approval in these committees. Originally, uh, we were moving forward the idea of having a supervisory um, authority at union level, 
coordinating um, supervision, cooperation, and enforcement with national enforcement bodies at member state level. It's useless to have uh, good recommendations, good legislation on paper, and then having lack of enforcement of something which is so complex. Um, after compromise stage, there was there was definitely uh, no support um, for for creating the supervisory authority. But after political negotiations, we ended up with a hybrid system, um, basically giving a central role to the commission. Because at least uh, with the system, we will have a basic level of cooperation and also a basic level also of, of enforcement, which is of utmost importance. When it comes to services directive and when it comes to the current e-commerce directive and the DSA. So I think that one of the biggest points that we have to keep in our mind, first of all, is also um, uh, fundamental points behind these two important pieces of legislation. So first of all, we are proposing a DSA built upon country of origin. When we have the services directive, uh, the, 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 the basic point of the services directive, which I believe is still relevant, still important, is the country of destination. If we expand the principle of um, country of origin to services, we would basically be going into the, into the direction of uh, race to the bottom when it comes, for example, for uh, employment conditions, um, etc. So it's really important that um, uh, although although the DSA and the e-commerce is a horizontal piece of legislation, um, we don't extend the scope of the DSA so much that it goes and affects um, provisions of the services directive. So I think that we have to make and continue to make this distinction between these two important pieces of union legislation. Ursula, um, I just wanted to ask you the same question. You know, I mean, where in the current e-commerce directive are there shortcomings with regard to services? I'm even thinking of things like um, accommodation on, on these sorts of marketplaces. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I mean, obviously, we're not only talking about products here. We're also talking about services and, and accommodation. Uh, and, and uh, tourism uh, um, um, services, uh, for example, that are very popular. And here again, we very often have situations uh, where you could imagine that the platform itself has a really dominant position. And I don't mean the dominant position in the field of um, competition law um, uh, definition, but I mean in regards to the trader that uses the platform. So maybe they control the payment uh, flows that go first to the platform and there is a provision that has to be paid. Maybe they control the way that the offer is presented. They have shaped the um, uh, rating mechanism, which is a very important element for consumers to trust the service. They are responsible for what ratings appear first. They accept payments for pushing certain offers uh, to the top, etc., etc. So in these circumstances, we think, uh, again, that there should be a joint liability of the platform itself. So if afterwards I find out that the apartment I booked is not at all in the way that it was advertised, uh, the offer I was given, if I find out that it is not free um, and in, in, in the time frame that I booked it, and I have instead to take out an expensive hotel booking because I'm already in the city that I wanted to go, it should also be the platform who is responsible towards uh, the consumer. If then there is a regress mechanism between the trader and the platform, that's a secondary question, but we think it really should then go back to the platform. Thank you. Um, I want to put a question to, to all of you uh, to sort of uh, before we, we be finish up. Um, you would often hear as, as a pushback against the sort of proposals that we're talking about today from platforms. Uh, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a moment and say that this will stifle innovation. Um, how do you react to that? Uh, Christophe, I'll let you answer first. Well, 
it, it probably depends on how you define innovation or what you consider uh, the, the proper price for uh, innovation or what would be a, um, a sustainable innovation from a societal uh, perspective. If, uh, if uh, innovation means uh, opening up the doors of the European market uh, to uh, uh, unsafe uh, products, that is, of course, a sort of innovation uh, uh, as compared to, uh, to, to the previous uh, situation, but I think, um, no, um, uh, to, to, to be serious, um, uh, even uh, if um, uh, uh, certainly the um, uh, uh, stricter uh, duties of diligence for, for platforms uh, increases the cost of doing business. That, that, that is uh, clear. Uh, either platforms can internalize this or pass it on uh, to merchants. Uh, and if that, in the end, means that uh, prices uh, for uh, consumers will slightly will be slightly higher, well then, that's maybe the price to pay for for buying safe products. Uh, so I'm, uh, and if if innovation uh, in inverted commas is only possible at uh, at the price of uh, having no control uh, uh, over safety of products, I think that's not not the type of innovation we would like. Catherine, same question to you. Um, do onerous obligations and platforms stifle innovation? I don't think so. I think innovation is born out of problems. So if this poses a problem for the platforms, I'm sure, you know, that a, a sensible solution will be found. They are, you know, professionals in, in terms of the data management. If we're talking about the know your business customer principle, they will have, a, you know, they will find a good way to do that um, through all of the data that they have, they already have. Um, and I would completely agree with the previous speaker, you know, at which cost do you want to defend certain practices? You know, we should make sure that all sales channels want to play a role in the well-established EU safety framework. And, and just to, and, and, and again, also about cost. Also, when I'm talking about normal shops, you know, physical shops selling toys, my first toy safety tip is if a deal seems too good to be true, then it usually is too good to be true. Um, and can I just show you one example of a toy, one of the toys that we found online? Can you see this? So it's a rattle. That means it's for the smallest, the youngest children, the children that we need to be really careful of. It's super easy to detach this. This can get into their throats. These things all come off. They can, so, you know, they can choke on these. And, they're, and they are, there are very sharp points. You know, you can talk about you will limit consumer choice. I don't think that's a choice we should be giving to consumers, to be honest. So, yeah, that's just my point. Very well made and illustrated. Um, Alex, I am sure you have heard the argument many times. So, uh, definitely, innovation must never come at a compromise for consumer health and safety and consumer protection. And if you look at the proposals that the Commission is talking about and that we are in line also with the Commission. And we have been delved into so much detail when it comes, for example, to the second pillar of our of our proposals, which is, for example, the um, Exante provisions. If you look at the raison d'etre, the aim of the Exante pro provisions is, first of all, to tackle um, those players who have a gatekeeping role, but not only just to tackle them, but to increase innovation, to inc increase also consumer choice. Because uh, until now, we have a congested um, ecosystem whereby we have a few players which are basically dominating with their uh, own rules. So they are playing only by their own rules. They are dominating um, the market. So we believe that with um, this type of regulation, with this, these types of recommendations, with this type uh, of internal market instrument that we are moving forward. We are not hampering innovation. We are not stifling innovation, but we are helping directly our SMEs, our startups, our innovators, the European ones too, especially, to be um, to function in a more contestable um, online environment and therefore to be more innovative and to invest more so that ultimately our consumers will have a better choice uh, out there. Ricardo, do we have to make a balance? Is it a balancing act? 
Well, I think that we should always make balance whatever you you are and uh, whenever you you whatever you are discussing. But I I, I really do agree with uh, all my previous uh, colleagues um, that perhaps sometimes we we must make the difference between because there is a big difference be, be, being between innovation and the, the operational costs and uh, uh, what we've heard from from especially from small players and startups is that they need to have, um, I would say, uh, for example, they are quite uh, uh, concerned with, uh, with the, 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 the monitoring obligations, creating of, of, of some, some kind of filters. Um, also, the need of uh, harmonizing the, 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 the liability uh, regimes. Those are the, the things that we've heard from them that, 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 that they are concerned with. And in fact, this is must, the, the, this, it is much more related to costs um, uh, on, on, on its uh, uh, business daily uh, activity than in than stifling uh, innovation. Um, but anyway, uh, this is something that we must uh, have in mind when discussing this. And uh, it's, I think that we should uh, uh, get some more clarity around those two concepts that from our perspective uh, are absolutely different. Thank you. Nina, um, did you hear this push back this argument um, when you were doing your research? Yes, absolutely. And I, and I think it's a fair, a fair pushback. But um, I guess I think this is really key to note that these are bad actors on platforms that are able to abuse systems um, and therefore um, these harms occur on these sites. I think it's really clear that we're not saying platforms are bad. What we're saying is that they are incredible innovators. They are some of the biggest companies in the world now and can do brilliant things to meet consumer need. And if you ever spoke to them about fairness and safety, they are all in complete agreement that that is exactly what they believe for their, for their users on their sites. Um, I think this is about how do we bring them into the fold and part of the fight to ensure compliance with um, our existing um, rules and laws and standards that we have in place and how can we marshal their brilliant innovation to improve the quality of our markets and um, people already believe that platforms are playing this role um, and therefore when they go onto these sites they're already behaving overconfidently um, with the choices that they are making because they think they are kept safe and I think uh, it's also worth to note that the cost is paid somewhere if not for cost of innovation, you will be paying for the cost in terms of people losing life-changing sums of money to scams online, um, the risk of life, uh, risk to life and health with dangerous products. You've got good businesses who are losing out when um, businesses are being forced to compete on um, their review and overall star rating status rather than actually the quality of their products. And actually, because of that, you could be seeing a general reduction in the quality of products that we are able to get. Um, and I think that's really key. There is going to be a cost somewhere. And we think this is a, a, a much more um, healthy way um, to start to look at how you can improve the quality and safeguard the quality of our markets with platforms. Thank you. Um, so finally, then as a wrap up before I come to Ursula, um, who I'm going to give the floor to to do a very final wrap up, um, to Christian, Ricardo and Catherine. If you had one message that you wanted to send in, you know, just in a few words to the Commission, what would that be? Um, Ricardo, I'll let you go first. Well, thank you, Jennifer. It's a, it's a great question and I will try to answer in 10 seconds. I think that we should, we should or at least the Commission should uh, keep a forward uh, looking approach uh, we really do need a future-proof regulation. This is very important, um, as from the consumer's perspective, as well from the industry one, and fit for the technological age. Uh, we should adapt something that has already 20 years old to something that it's not just up-to-date, but updated and especially looking forward, and something that in 10 years we could say, well, uh, it's still uh, something that it's uh, uh, really updated. This is one of the uh, uh, big messages that I think that we should share with, with the Commission. Thanks. Thank you. Catherine, your, your short message to the Commission. I agree with Ricardo. Um, I would also say for us, in, I mean, enforcement is key. And that's why we, we really need preventative measures. 
So reaction in this case, I, you know, on notices from consumers or market surveillance authorities, it is not going to work. It has proven ineffective. So we need to create the right incentives and obligations for marketplaces to take action before the toys are put up for sale. Thank you, Alex. Uh, one brief message to the Commission. Yes, our, our, our message is clear as a European Parliament. We want the Commission to be as ambitious, as progressive as the European Parliament has been uh, with its uh, strong majorities in the three reports that we had in front of us in the IMCO report, LIBE report and the URI report. And especially when it comes to, again, and I'm reiterating this point and I'm making it very clear, especially when it comes to online marketplaces. Um, uh, we are, to put it mildly, we are not happy with um, the first leaked versions of the Commission when it comes to giving the required importance for achieving and aiming to achieve a higher level of consumer protection um, in, the, in the online ecosystem. And we definitely want the Commission to be as ambitious as we were also, and especially when it comes to elements uh, and the chapter dealing with online marketplaces. It's of fundamental importance to us. Well, you've still got quite a lot of work ahead of you with the Parliament. Um, Christoph, your final thoughts as well, your final message. Well, much has been said already, and I uh, can uh, only uh, underline what Ricardo uh, has said, that uh, uh, shaping a future-proof uh, um, uh, regulatory framework is, is very important. But I think there is a second point that is very important as well, and that is legal certainty uh, for uh, uh, consumers and businesses uh, alike. So if, uh, for example, uh, a liability regime uh, is, is tied to the notion of decisive influence, uh, that's a very vague concept. Uh, we would need some, at least, indicative criteria to help uh, uh, operators uh, on the market uh, to understand uh, whether they are in or out. So legal certainty, I think, is also a key requirement here. Thank you very much. Ursula, um, you've heard a lot. I'm going to ask for your closing remarks. They have organized this event to talk about it. Um, I think we've all been rather singing from the same hymn sheet a little bit. Uh, so, so give me uh, your, your impressions of, of how things are going to pan out in the future. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, let me first of all thank uh, the panelists here. I think we have heard brilliant points. So thank you to Nina, Catherine, Alex, Ricardo and Christophe. And thank you to you, Jennifer, for the great moderation. Thank you to the audience out there. We don't see you, but uh, we hope that you uh, enjoyed the session. And let me maybe just say that this is the first out of a number of BIOC consumer debates that we will launch uh, in the next uh, few weeks and months. So bear with us for the next version, please. Well, if I would have to wrap up, uh, which is actually very difficult because this is such a huge, um, a huge area of discussion. There are so many different elements. It's the gatekeeper role, it's the anti-competitive behavior, it's the illegal activities. And maybe let me just also um, recall that in the Parliament report, there is another very important point, which is the uh, behavioral advertising and the commercial surveillance that we have increasingly um, uh, in all different areas of our lives. And, and, and that is a very important point and certainly, I guess, would become a very good debate next time. But for this debate on the DSA, it's very complex. In the end, it will be a political choice that needs to be made on how to protect consumers. And I think there is enough recommendations and we are extremely happy that the parliament has made such an ambitious uh, uh, plea to the commission to say that we have to adapt the liability regime. Self-regulation is not enough and it is not nearly enough. We cannot keep it to that. And it's about harmful business models that we need to change also with the advertising and it's about enforcement. So let me just conclude that we are very optimistic, actually, that what Ursula von der Leyen, the Commission President, announced when she took on uh, her term of office, uh, she said that we will upgrade, the Commission will upgrade the liability and safety rules for the digital platforms. So we really want also to hold the Commission to account and we're optimistic that the debate is going uh, into that direction. Uh, we will see very soon. So thank you very much again to everybody. Thanks, Alex. 
Thank you, Ursula, and thank you everyone who joined us online. Um, we had dozens and dozens of questions. As you mentioned, Ursula, it's a very broad area. It's a very big package. Uh, and of course, we couldn't get to everything today, but thank you all for that. Thank you, Nina, for your presentation, kicking us off, to Beo for organizing, and of course, to all the panelists. And uh, have a great day and a great weekend.